hello everybody. My name is Kylie Briggs. I'm the Northeast Turtle Conservation Coordinator for the Orian Society. And while most of my work is in fact focused on turtle conservation here in the Northeast, I'm actually here today to talk to you about vernal pools, which are a very critical ecosystem in forested landscapes. And uh, just to give you an idea of, of what we'll be covering in today's video, uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about what makes vernal pools unique and what makes them a vernal pool. And then we'll spend a lot of time going into the specific species that live in these places. And it's not just amphibians like frogs and salamanders that depend on vernal pools. There's a whole wealth of invertebrates as well that uh, call these wetlands home. So first, uh, before we get into all of that, what is a vernal pool? Uh, vernal pools, by definition, are not permanent bodies of water. They actually dry up most summers. And then in the spring, they fill with rainwater and snowmelt that's coming off of the mountains. And why all this is really important is because the vernal pools actually dry up. That means that fish can't survive here. And if the vernal pool doesn't have fish, then amphibians don't have to worry about fish as predators. Uh, fish are big time consumers of amphibians and their eggs. So to find a water body that doesn't have fish is a really special thing for an amphibian. However, because this pool does dry up in the summer, that means there isn't a lot of time for the amphibians to get here, lay their eggs, and have those eggs hatch and eventually metamorphose into small frogs and salamanders and get out of there before the pool dries up, which means that the frogs and salamanders that breed in this sort of habitat are among the earliest amphibians that you're going to see on any given year. Uh, wood frogs, for example, are actually freeze tolerant. They can survive freezing almost entirely solid. And because of that, that means that they can overwinter very close to the surface, just underneath some leaf litter. And when spring does arrive, they thaw out, they wake up, they head down to the vernal pools and start calling and lay their eggs before other species such as American toads have even begun to notice that spring is just around the corner. And uh, spotted salamanders as well, although they're not freeze tolerant, uh, they're up and moving around and heading towards these vernal pools, oftentimes when there's still quite a bit of snow on the ground. And in fact, when I was here just the other day, there was still ice and snow on this particular vernal pool. So uh, now we're gonna get into more of the specifics, starting with the amphibians that call these vernal pools home. And then we're gonna get into more of the uh, invertebrates and other types of animals that you can find in these biodiversity hotspots. Before we get into all of that, I do need to stress a couple points. One is that vernal pools are actually very sensitive ecosystems. So if a bunch of people regularly visit vernal pools and just walk through them and start dip netting stuff out of them, you can actually damage the habitat and kick up sediments that might settle on top of amphibian eggs and cut them off from oxygen. So there are some things that I'm going to do in this video that I'm doing for educational purposes, uh, but this is a vernal pool that is uh, very close to my house. Not very many people visit it and having that one-time disturbance for the purposes of an educational demonstration, I think is worthwhile to convey to you what sort of uh, biodiversity you might have in your own backyards that you didn't know about. And furthermore, I actually have some traps set in these vernal pools that I use to monitor amphibian populations. And I really need to stress the fact that using traps to monitor or capture amphibians does require a special research or educational permit, which is one that I have issued from the state of Vermont. The rules vary from state to state, uh, but the odds are using a trap in this sort of wetland is not something that you can or should be doing on your own without a trained professional doing it with you. What I want to show you here today is uh, a method that I've been using to sort of keep tabs on the amphibians in this particular uh, wetland over the last couple years. And that is uh, through use of catch and release trapping. And uh, the traps that I use are, are pretty much identical to minnow traps. They have a uh, uh, they have a funnel on both ends uh, so that animals, as they sort of work their way around the trap and accidentally get in, uh, the funnel guides them into the trap and then um, afterwards they just have a difficult time getting back out. But what I really want to show you is, is what I have in this particular trap right now because um, I've been monitoring this pool for the last two weeks uh, during this period of social distancing and I have, I have yet to find a salamander here this year uh, until today. And it wasn't just one salamander, it was a bunch. So this is what the trap looks like. So again, standard standard minnow trap, but uh, it's unusual to get this many amphibians in, in one particular trap. So I'm just gonna 
take the uh, take the one end off here and show you what I got. We just have tons and tons of frogs, spotted salamanders. I'm hoping there's a blue spotted or Jefferson salamander in here too. It's okay if these frogs are getting out. I'm keeping a rough count. Um, and when you get this many amphibians in a trap, what usually this means is that uh, a female salamander or frog arrived and then a whole bunch of males came in here uh, hoping to mate with that female. So uh, I'm going to take the frogs out and then one by one we'll figure out if these uh, salamanders are mostly male. So for our first salamander, uh, the way that you tell males from females for something like a spotted salamander is if you look underneath, you see right here, uh, behind the legs at the base of the tail is uh, sort of like a swollen um, area. On a female, um, this, this spot right here um, would not be noticeable at all. See from the top, you can even kind of see that it's got some swelling at the base of the tail. If it were a female, uh, you wouldn't notice that. So there's one male spotted salamander. Two males. Get some more frogs out of here. Eleven males. Uh, Twelve males. So we actually didn't have a single female in this trap, which is a little unusual. Uh, but on the other hand, um, this time, this time of year during the early spring. Uh, it is the males that arrive at the pools first, so um, even though I was thinking that we'd have just a small number of females that attracted a bunch of males into this particular trap, um, the males get here first and then they stay in the pools longer so that as each female arrives, they have as many opportunities to mate as possible. Uh, and then eventually when there aren't any females left, the males will start to, to leave these wetlands and, and head back into, the, uh, back into the woods. So I think that's what we're seeing here today is just that um, there were uh, a lot of males in this pool last night and the females either haven't really shown up yet or there just aren't very many of them in this pool. But I have another trap. We're gonna go check that one right now and just see what's going on. I can actually see some movement in it right now, which is good. It means we've got something. I'm not expecting that many amphibians again, but we'll see. Frog, 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 frog. So one of the more common amphibians that you see at the vernal pools is the wood frog. This is a small, just a couple inch long, dark frog. Um, they might be a light tan. Usually in the early spring when they're this cold, they're a very dark brown, almost black. You can hardly see that on their back, they have these two ridges along, uh, along the edge of their, their, uh, their backbone. And uh, that's just a helpful field mark. It's called the dorsolateral ridge. If this frog were lighter in coloration, you would see that it has a dark mask on the face, like a, like a bandit mask. I'll, I'll look up a picture later and, and uh, just splice it right in here for you. Uh, light belly, sometimes some dark modeling on the chest. And um, this is a frog that is freeze tolerant. They can survive uh, a certain level of, of freezing during the winter and uh, they'll freeze almost entirely solid and as long as they uh, don't get too cold uh, or stay frozen for too long uh, they'll wake back up in the spring and then uh, make it to the vernal pools and uh, the reason that this is very important is uh, as i mentioned these vernal pools dry up in the summer so the frogs have to get here as early as possible in order to lay their eggs and uh, being able to freeze solid means that these frogs can overwinter very close to the surface and that means when the spring does arrive, uh, these frogs thaw out before many other species of amphibian, like the American toad, uh, are even, are even uh, starting to move around or, or become aware that it's spring. Uh, so they can get here before other species, lay their eggs first, and then get out of here. And uh, with any luck, they've arrived and laid their eggs early enough so that those eggs can hatch and the tadpoles can metamorphose into small frogs before the vernal pool loses its water. All right, so there's that last trap. It looks like the water level came down a little bit. The trap's almost out of the water, which is not super encouraging. Oh, actually, I think we got one. Just one salamander in this whole trap. And it's what we were looking for. This is great. Come on, get out. 
So actually, this isn't, uh, I wouldn't call this a blue spotted salamander. Um, it is, I'm fairly certain, a hybrid with a blue spotted salamander. Uh, but this one, I think, looks a little more closely uh, to a Jefferson salamander, which would mean that this is a, a hybrid that is more closely associated with, genetically, uh, the Jefferson salamander species as opposed to the blue spotted. So it's a mostly uh, dark, sort of grayish brown coloration. Um, a pure blue spotted salamander tends to be a little bit darker in coloration. They're also much smaller than this. Um, the hybrids can actually be larger than both of the, uh, the pure species. And uh, there's some other things here. So uh, fairly long toes on the feet. That's another Jefferson salamander trait. Uh, the snout is short and rounded, which is actually uh, a blue spotted salamander trait. So remember, we are looking at a hybrid. And there is some blue specking on the sides there, but it's not nearly as distinct as I would expect from a blue spotted salamander or one that's closer genetically to the blue spotted salamanders. So um, a hybrid, but closer to a Jefferson. And uh, while I've seen these many times at other locations, this is my first time finding a live one here, which is really exciting. <sighs> I forgot to tell you something. So remember with those spotted salamanders I was showing you earlier, they had the swelling at the base of the tail, uh, which means that they are male. If we look this one, flip this one over, uh, you see a very different story. So there's really no swelling there, indicating that this is a female, which is what you would expect from a hybrid blue-spotted Jefferson salamander. Uh, the hybrids are almost entirely female. Uh, like I said, though, that's a complicated story that we're not going to get into right now. All right, so it's another day, and we're back at uh, one of the same vernal pools that I've shown you some things from a number of times now. Uh, but today things are a little bit warmer. The last couple days have been warmer than it has been uh, really at all this year. And that's brought out a few more species that we haven't yet seen in this particular vernal pool. And uh, today, the first thing I want to show you are eastern newts, a semi-aquatic, mostly aquatic species of salamander uh, and their adult form spend pretty much their entire lives in vernal pools. Though they are pretty flexible if the vernal pool dries up. Uh, which they tend to do in the summer. These newts will leave the water and spend the summer on land uh, and then return to the water and stay there pretty much whenever the vernal pool actually has water in it. And what we're looking at, see if I can give you a closer look, are sort of like olive brown colored salamanders, a few inches long. They have these, I don't know if you can see this, uh, red spots on the back. And one thing that's really unique about Eastern newts is that they have three different distinct stages to their life cycle, which is they have a fully aquatic larva with external gills, as all amphibians do. So the larvae, external gills, fully aquatic, and then they metamorphose into a terrestrial juvenile. Those are those bright orange salamanders that you find walking around on the forest floors with red dots on the back. And they might stay in that red eft form uh, for upwards of three or four years. They've been documented as red efts uh, for upwards of eight years. And then eventually they'll make that move uh, and transform one more time into the adult. They'll lose that bright orange coloration, turn into more of this olive brown, olive green color, uh, and spend the rest of their lives mostly in the water. And one of the newts that we have here today appears to be uh, in a transitional form, maybe recently transformed from an eft to uh, an adult, so it still has some of that orange coloration, but not nearly as bright as those red Fs that you see walking around on the forest floor. And another thing about them, so no matter what their life stage is, uh, sorry, if they're an Eft or an adult, not the larvae, or at least not a very small larvae, uh, they're also going to have these black polka dot patterns on their belly. One thing that a lot of people don't realize about eastern newts is that they're voracious predators in these ecosystems and they actually prey on the eggs and larvae of other amphibians. So we've arrived at yet another vernal pool. Uh, this one is the largest of the pools that I've been monitoring this spring. And uh, unlike the others, I haven't actually captured or seen a salamander here yet. Uh, but when I approached, there was a pretty strong chorus of wood frogs calling behind me. Of course, when I approached, the wood frogs became scared and stopped calling. Uh, however, thanks to the magic of uh, digital post editing, we can just bring those back up for a moment. Listen to the wood frogs back there. It's uh, quite, a, quite a party, or at least it was before I interrupted it. And um, 
we've already seen and talked about the frogs themselves at some of the other pools. Now this pool, even though I haven't seen a salamander yet, I do know that at the very least some males have arrived. The reason I know that is because uh, unlike frogs, which uh, fertilize their eggs externally, the male attaches to the back of the female, uh, something called amplexus, and then will fertilize the eggs as they leave her body. With salamanders, uh, the male will deposit a little packet of sperm on some leaf litter or a branch. Uh, that packet is called a spermatophore. And uh, when successfully courting a female salamander, she will pick that up with her cloaca, retain it for a short period of time, and then fertilize her eggs internally. So when she lays them, at that point, the eggs are already fertilized. The male's part in all of this is over. So frogs and salamanders, when they're in vernal pools, they're very secretive. You might be able to hear the frogs calling from a distance, but if the weather's not right, and it's just not warm enough for the frogs to be calling, uh, you might visit the pool and not actually see any, even though there are dozens or hundreds of them nearby. And the same is true of salamanders, except salamanders don't even vocalize, so you don't have that to go on. However, you don't actually have to see the frogs and salamanders themselves to know that they've been breeding in these wetlands. And uh, the reason for that, of course, is that they lay eggs. And it's possible to look at the characteristics of each of the types of eggs and figure out what species they belong to. So I'm just going to show you the three different uh, types of amphibian eggs that I found in the vernal pools so far today and uh, walk you through how I know which one belongs to which species. So we're going to start with the wood frog. The uh, wood frogs lay egg masses of, um, you know, up to 200 or 250 eggs at a time. And um, when that egg mass is first laid, um, it's only going to be about the size of, of a large marble. And uh, then over time, it gradually expands, it absorbs water, and will eventually become about the size of a baseball. So this is what we have uh, as, as an example of wood frog eggs. And uh, just to give you an idea of, of what we're looking at here, each individual egg has a black embryo and then a clear membrane around it. So that, that is the egg itself. And then they're all stuck together to form an egg mass. And um, the space, the width of that membrane or between the embryo and the membrane uh, is going to be about the same size of the embryo itself, maybe a little bit larger. And um, there's nothing holding this entire egg mass together. It's just a bunch of eggs um, sort of combined into a mass. And I'm just gonna pick it up here for a moment. So you can get a much better look here. Uh, these eggs are typically attached just to a stick or a blade of grass in the water. And uh, depending on temperatures, they'll be there for a, a couple weeks or so before the young can um, mature enough to hatch out of the eggs. When wood frogs lay their eggs in a wetland, it's pretty typical for most of the frogs to lay their eggs in the same general area. You might have an entire vernal pool with lots of places in it that look like good spots for frogs to lay eggs, but you'll find that about 90% of the eggs are all in just one tiny little spot very close together, and you'll see that these sort of breeding parties where almost all of the wood frogs are just all bunched together in one part of the vernal pool, calling, mating, laying eggs, and then the rest of the pool might have a few egg masses here and there, but not nearly to the same extent. And that location might change from year to year. It all just depends on where the party starts at the beginning of a particular breeding season. Now, one real big difference between wood frog eggs and the salamanders that breed in these pools is that the salamanders have in addition to the black embryo and the vitelline membrane around the egg, uh, around the embryo, there's also an additional layer of gel holding the entire egg mass together, which you're not going to see on the frog eggs. So here's an example of spotted salamander eggs. So again, we have that black embryo, the clear membrane around it, so that's the egg, and then an additional space of about a centimeter of just clear gel holding this whole egg mass together. And the egg mass itself is fairly firm. If I were to open my fingers up, uh, the egg mass is not going to just droop right through. It's holding its shape pretty well. Um, spotted salamander egg masses, um, you know, they vary in size and number of eggs, but a hundred or so eggs is, is not unusual. Sometimes you find them quite a bit smaller. And uh, these eggs also take a little bit longer to, uh, to develop than, than that of a wood frog. 
And then the last one that we have here is the Jefferson salamander egg mass. So uh, very similar to the spotted salamander eggs, except in size. So these are much smaller egg masses, uh, also attached to just sticks or blades of grass in the water. And we're just looking at maybe 10 or 15 eggs and that's it. So much smaller than the spotted salamanders, which would, could be up to a couple hundred eggs. But then remember how the spotted salamander egg mass is very firm. When I spread my fingers apart, the egg mass held its shape. It was not about to ooze right through. I'm going to very gently attempt to pick this egg mass up and show you that for Jefferson salamander egg masses, uh, they're not firm at all. So this egg mass just flattened right out. It's not holding any sort of shape. If I open my fingers, it just starts to ooze right through and it's just barely attached to this stick. So that's very typical of Jefferson salamander egg masses. And um, the Jefferson salamanders do hybridize with another similar species called the blue spotted salamander. Uh, blue spotted salamanders don't normally lay, uh, they don't lay egg masses. They'll just lay one or two eggs at a time attached to leaves on the bottom of the pool. And when the two species hybridize, uh, the egg masses might look um, anywhere between that of just the individual eggs of the blue spotted salamander or these small egg masses of the Jefferson. However, a lot of the eggs are uh, non-viable, meaning they are not able to survive. It could be just some genetic, um, genetic incompatibility. And those non-viable eggs uh, are usually colonized by a water mold that turns them sort of gray and fuzzy. And uh, you can recognize when a population uh, at a particular vernal pool it has a lot of hybrids in it because you'll see egg masses that just have a lot of nine non-viable embryos. So far, I've only found viable, completely viable egg masses here. And the salamanders I've been seeing uh, look much more similar to a Jefferson salamander than a blue spotted. So I'm thinking that this is possibly a purebred population, um, maybe with a, a smaller number of hybrids. So the reason I've actually brought you to this particular vernal pool isn't to show you more frogs and salamanders. We've already done that. Uh, but I know that this pool is really easy to find some really cool invertebrates, uh, some of which specialize in vernal pools. Uh, one in particular is called a fingernail clam. They're these really small woodland clams. They're also known as pea clams uh, that can live two or three years uh, of age. They only get maybe two or three or four millimeters in, in total size. And uh, it, the remarkable thing is that they're actually able to survive in wetlands like this, even though this vernal pool will lose its water by midsummer, the fingernail clams will just burrow into the substrate where it remains somewhat moist and wait there until the following spring. Uh, so the fingernail clams that we're looking for aren't something that you would normally see if you're just walking around a vernal pool and looking into the water because they're so small and they're hiding in the leaf litter. But if you very gently uh, take a net and just pick up some of that leaf material and then sift through it, if you're looking very carefully, you, you oftentimes will find uh, these little fingernail or pea clams. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I am going to be very careful not to disturb any amphibian eggs that are in the water right now because if I were to kick up a bunch of sediments and then the sediments settle on top of the eggs, it may cut them off from oxygen and affect their survival rates. Uh, but I know that there are a bunch of frog eggs over there. And we're over here in an area where I don't see a lot of uh, material that um, frogs or salamanders would normally attach their eggs to. So we're just going to take a few scoops, see if we get anything. Nothing there. First try over here. So right here. This is one of the fingernail clams that we're looking for. So that's about as big as they get. This could be a two or three year old clam, which is I think quite remarkable. There are lots of different species of fingernail clams and we're not going to try to figure out which ones these are because they all look very, very similar. Here's another one. Maybe we can find a really small one in here. And some of these species of fingernail clam uh, are actually specially adapted to live in vernal pools. And you can use the habitat to narrow down the list of possible species, uh, but that list would still be pretty long. There's a nice little cluster. 
And what's remarkable about these clams is, uh, well, how do they get here? And there are a number of theories uh, that I've heard about how fingernail clams actually get from one body of water to another. And I didn't actually believe it until I saw it for myself. You'll read sometimes that they might clamp down onto the toes of salamanders and then stay on that salamander uh, as that salamander goes back into the uplands and then stay with that salamander all through the summer and the winter and then still be on that salamander when it goes back to the wetlands the next spring. And uh, that just sounded ridiculous to me until uh, doing some monitoring at one particular site, we had a drift fence set up that was intercepting salamanders as they were migrating to the vernal pools at the very earliest time in the spring when they could do that. And some of those salamanders that hadn't actually been in the water for almost a year at that point had the clams actually attached to their, to their toes, which is just remarkable. And if you think about that, um, you know, salamanders don't travel very far. They often go to the same pool every single year. So that's not a really effective dispersal strategy for the clam. However, if the fingernail clam were to attach to say the feathers of a forest bird or something, and then that bird flies off and finds some water somewhere else, then it actually can jump from spot to spot. And that's how these clams end up in the middle of the woods in places that you would never think an animal like that could survive, especially if the water isn't even permanent. And of course, who could forget the mosquito? Uh, mosquitoes are a very big part of wetland ecology, and that includes vernal pools. And of course, we're all familiar with the adult form of the mosquito. Uh, they're you know, the bane of my existence, as they are to many other people, especially folk that work outdoors. Uh, but they serve a very critical role in vernal pools. And in particular, I'm thinking of their role as food for larval salamanders. Uh, you know, these salamanders, when they hatch and start looking for food, uh, they're pretty much strictly carnivorous. Uh, they can get a little bit of food just by eating the casing of their own eggs. Uh, but once that's gone, they have to start roaming around the pool and looking for things uh, that are wriggling around and eating. And there are lots of invertebrates in here. But in terms of sheer numbers, there are probably more mosquito larvae in this pool than anything else put together in the insect world. And that's just a very, very critical source of nutrition for these salamanders, which are very, very small when they, when they first hatch. And they wouldn't be able to actually consume some of the larger invertebrates in here until they actually uh, chunk up on mosquito larvae for a little while, as well as some other small types of invertebrates. So it's another day on the vernal pools, and uh, I have for you an additional vertebrate that I was hoping to find earlier, uh, but it wasn't until today that we were actually able to get one, and that is the predaceous diving beetle. This is another aquatic uh, beetle that you can find in many types of water, but uh, vernal pools are a pretty common place where you might find them and the species of beetle that does uh, prey on amphibians. These, these aren't likely to capture and kill an entire frog or salamander, uh, but you do sometimes find them attached to the side of an amphibian and they're just going to bite off a little piece of skin and then uh, they will carry on their way. So here we go, predaceous diving beetle. This is one of the more common species of, uh, of beetle that you actually get in vernal pools alongside amphibians. And in case you were wondering, ah, they, uh, they do bite pretty, pretty hard sometimes. And the other uh, type of invertebrate that I wanted to show you today is uh, the larvae of an insect called the caddisfly. What's really cool about caddisfly larvae is that they build little houses out of either rocks or sticks or leaf material. These tubes that they'll wear over their abdomen as a source of protection, much like the shell of a hermit crab, but it's something that the caddisflies fashion from small bits of debris. And there's a group of caddisflies that uh, are really strongly associated with vernal pool wetlands like this. And uh, that particular group is called the bizarre caddisfly, which is an entire family consisting of dozens, if not hundreds of different species. Uh, but what's really important about the bizarre caddisflies is that uh, they'll cut up dead leaves into smaller pieces and then construct their protective cases out of those uh, cut up leaves. And what that actually does is process those leaves into smaller pieces so that other animals that live in this vernal pool are able to eat those small fragments, whereas they wouldn't have been able to eat uh, an entire leaf. So the caddisflies are actually serving a very important function as part of this vernal pool ecosystem, something that the amphibians can even benefit from. 
In addition to the fingernail clams and some of the insect invertebrates that we've looked at already, vernal pools are also home to a few different types of crustaceans that a lot of people might overlook if they were to take a closer look at these pools. A fairy shrimp, for example, of which there are at least a couple species in Vermont, uh, are absolutely dependent on vernal pools. You don't typically find them in other types of wetlands. And then another crustacean called the seed shrimp or ostracod um, is one that you can find in these wetlands. And the seed shrimp, their eggs are drought tolerant. So even though the adult is aquatic and can't survive through the summer when these vernal pools lose water, the eggs can. And that's why almost as soon as the pool is filled with water, you can find these crustaceans swimming around. And the eggs will also attach to the feathers of birds or uh, the hairs of other wildlife and can easily be dispersed from one pool to another. And that's how these aquatic crustaceans are able to colonize vernal pools out in the middle of the woods. So I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and learn about some of the really interesting uh, wildlife that depends on vernal pools. And I really hope that if you've learned anything from this video, it's that vernal pools are biodiversity hotspots. If these systems were to disappear, if this one little wetland were to be drained and converted into some other type of, of uh, habitat for human purposes, then you don't just lose the wetland itself, but you lose a lot of the biodiversity in the surrounding forest. The frogs and salamanders that you see here in the spring, they can disperse over a thousand feet into the woods every single summer. And you wouldn't necessarily know just walking through the woods and finding eastern newts or wood frogs or the occasional spotted salamander that they wouldn't be there if it weren't for habitats like this. So uh, I appreciate you all taking the time to learn about some of the animals that depend on these ecosystems with me and I look forward to figuring out something else to show you later. Ta-ta!